I am Anansi, keeper of stories. Settle down while I stir the pot. Join me while I spin a tale. Welcome to Anansi Storytime. I'm your host, Morgan Hazelwood. Today, we have the story of a boisterous tailor's adventures. The story is The Valiant Tailor from the Brothers Grimm, and it is rated PG. Our players are Matt Hinton, LJ Donnell, Christian, Andrew Whitby, Brannon, Scott Smith, and Anya Connolly. Please enjoy. Come, sit, listen. I once heard a story that started like this. One summer's morning, a little tailor was sitting on his table by the window. He was in good spirits and sewed with all his might. Then came a peasant woman down the street, crying out that she had cheap jams for sale. This rang pleasantly in the tailor's ears. He stretched his delicate head out the window. Come up here, dear woman. Here you will be rid of your goods. The woman came up the three steps to the tailor with her heavy basket in hand and he made her unpack the whole of the pots for him to see. He inspected all of them, lifted them up, put his nose to them, and at length he spoke. The jam seems to me to be good, so weigh me out four ounces, dear woman, and if it is a quarter of a pound, that is of no consequence. The woman, who had hoped to find a good sale, gave him what he desired, but went away quite angry and grumbling. Now. God bless the jam to my use, and give me health and strength. So he brought the bread out of the cupboard, cut himself a piece right across the loaf, and spread the jam over it. This won't spoil, so I will just finish this jacket before I take a bite. He laid the bread near him, sewed on, and in his joy, made bigger and bigger stitches. In the meantime, the smell of the sweet jam ascended the wall where the flies were sitting in great numbers so that they were attracted and descended on it in hosts. Whoa! Who invited you? He drove the unbidden guests away. The flies, who understood no German, would not be turned away but came back again in ever-increasing companies. Then the little tailor at last lost all patience and got a bit of cloth from under his work table. Wait, and I'll give it to you. He struck them mercilessly with the cloth. When he drew it away and counted, there lay before him no fewer than seven flies, dead and with legs stretched out. He could not help but admire his own bravery. Art thou a fellow of that sort? The whole town shall know of this feat. And the little tailor hastened to cut himself a girdle, stitch it, and embroider on it in large letters, seven at one stroke. Ah, the town, the whole world shall know of this. His heart wagged with joy like a lamb's tail. The tailor put on the girdle and resolved to go forth into the world because he thought his workshop was too small for his valor. Before he went away, he sought about in the house to see if there was anything which he could take with him. He found nothing but a soft cheese, and that he put in his pocket. Then he set off. In front of the door, he observed a bird which had caught itself in the thicket. Hello, little bird. You shall come with me too. Into my pocket you go. Now off to tell the world of my valor. The road led him up a mountain, and when he had reached the highest point of it, there sat a powerful giant looking about her quite comfortably. The little tailor adjusted his girdle and approached her. Good day, comrade. So thou art sitting there, overlooking the widespread world. I am just on my way thither, and want to try my luck. Hast thou any inclination to go with me? Thou ragamuffin! Thou miserable creature! Oh, indeed. He unbuttoned his coat and showed the giant, who squinted to read the girdle. There mayst thou read what kind of man I am. Seven at one stroke? What a deed, to kill seven men in one stroke. Surely this little man deserves some measure of respect. Nevertheless, I wish to try him first. The giant took a stone in her hand and squeezed it together so that water dropped out of it. Do that likewise, if thou hast strength. Is that all? 
That is child's play with us. He put his hand into his pocket, brought out the soft cheese, and pressed it until the liquid ran out of it. Faith, that was a little better, wasn't it? The giant did not know what to say and could not believe it of the little man. Then the giant picked up a stone and threw it so high that the eye could scarcely follow it. Now, little mite of a man, do that likewise. Well thrown, but after all, the stone came back to earth again. I will throw you one which will never come back at all. He put his hand into his pocket, took out the bird, and threw it into the air. The bird, delighted with its liberty, rose, flew away, and did not come back. How does that shot please you, comrade? Thou art certainly strong, but now we will see if thou art able to carry anything properly. She took the tailor to a mighty oak tree which lay there felled on the ground. If thou art strong enough, help me to carry the tree out of the forest. Readily, take thou the trunk on thy shoulders, and I will raise up the branches and twigs. After all, they are the heaviest. The giant took the trunk on his shoulder, but the tailor seated himself on a branch, and the giant, who could not look round, had to carry away the whole tree and the tailor in the bargain. He behind was quite merry and happy, and whistled as if carrying the tree were child's play. Hark you! Though we are but halfway, I can go no further. I shall have to let the tree fall. The tailor sprang nimbly down, and seized the tree with both arms as if he had been carrying it. Thou art such a great fellow, and yet canst not even carry the tree? They went on together, and as they passed the cherry tree, the giant laid hold of the top of the tree where the ripest fruit was hanging, bent it down, gave it into the tailor's hand, and bade him eat. But the little tailor was much too weak to hold the tree, and when the giant let it go, it sprang back again, and the tailor was hurled into the air with it. Fortunately, he landed without injury. What is this? Hast thou not the strength to hold the weak twig? I have no lack of strength. Dost thou think that could be anything to a man who has struck down seven at one blow? I leapt over the tree because the huntsmen are shooting down there in the thicket. Jump as I did if thou canst do it. The giant made the attempt but could not get over the tree and remained hanging in the branches, so that in this also the tailor kept the upper hand. If thou art such a valiant fellow, come with me into our cavern and spend the night with us. The little fellow was willing and followed her. When they went into the cave, other giants were sitting there by the fire, and each of them had a roasted sheep in their hand and was eating it. It is much more spacious here than in my workshop. Here is a bed. Sleep if you wish. I will see you in the morning. This is too much bed for one my size. I shall sleep in the corner. When it was midnight and the giant thought that the little tailor was lying in a sound sleep, she got up, took a great iron bar, cut through the bed with one blow, and thought she had given the grasshopper his finishing stroke. With the earliest dawn, the giants went into the forest and had quite forgotten the little tailor, when all at once he walked up to them quite merrily and boldly. The giants were terrified. They were afraid that he would strike them all dead and ran away in a great hurry. The little tailor went onwards, always following his own pointed nose. After he had walked for a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and as he felt weary, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. Whilst there, the people came and inspected him on all sides and read his girdle. Seven at one stroke? Ha! Why tarries this great warrior here in the midst of peace? He must be a mighty lord. They went and announced him to their queen, and gave it as their opinion that if war should break out, this would be a weighty and useful man who ought on no account be allowed to depart. The council pleased the queen, and she sent one of her courtiers to the little tailor to offer him military service when he awoke. For this very reason I have come here. I'm ready to enter the queen's service. He was therefore honorably received, and a separate dwelling was assigned him. The soldiers, however, were set against the little tailor and wished him a thousand miles away. What is to be the end of this? If we quarrel with him, 
and he strikes about him. Seven of us will fall at every blow. Not one of us could stand against him, but that he were a thousand miles away. They came, therefore, to a decision, betook themselves in a body to the queen, and begged for their dismissal from service. We are not prepared to stay with a man who kills seven at one stroke. I'm sorry for the sake of one I should lose all my faithful servants. I wish I had never laid eyes on him. I shall not venture to give him dismissal, lest he should strike me and all my people down and take his place on the royal throne. She thought about it for a long time and at last found good counsel. She sent for the little tailor to attend her. Because you are such a great warrior, I have one request. In a forest of my country live two giants who caused great mischief with their robbing, murdering, ravaging, and burning, and no one can approach them without putting himself in danger of death. If you conquered and killed these two giants, I would give you my only daughter to wife, and half of this kingdom as dowry. Likewise, one hundred horsemen will ride to assist you. That would indeed be a fine thing for a man like me. One is not offered a beautiful princess and half a kingdom every day. Oh yes, I will soon subdue the giants, and do not require the help of a hundred horsemen to do it, for he who can hit seven at one blow has no need to be afraid of two. The little tailor went forth, and the hundred horsemen followed him. Soon they arrived at the outskirts of the forest. Just wait here. I alone will finish off the giants. He bounded into the forest, looking about right and left. After a while, he perceived both giants laying under a tree. They slept so soundly and snored so strongly that the branches waved up and down. The little tailor, not idle, gathered two pocketfuls of stones and with these climbed up the tree. When he was halfway up, he slipped out over a branch until he sat just above the sleepers. He then let one stone after another fall on the breast of one of the giants. For a long time, the giant felt nothing, but at last he awoke and pushed his comrade. Why art thou knocking me? Thou must be dreaming. I am not knocking thee. They laid themselves down to sleep again, and then the tailor threw a stone down on the second. What is the meaning of this? Why art thou pelting me? I am not pelting thee. They disputed about it for a time, but as they were weary, they let the matter rest, and their eyes closed once more. The little tailor began his game again, picked out the biggest stone, and threw it with all his might on the breast of the first giant. That is too bad. He sprang up like a madman and pushed his companion against the tree until it shook. The other paid him back in the same coin and they got into such a rage that they tore up trees and belabored each other so long that at last they both fell down dead. It's a lucky thing that they did not tear up the tree on which I was sitting, or I should have had to spring onto another like a squirrel. But we tailors are nimble. Now let me jump down and do my work. He drew out his sword and gave each of them a couple thrusts in the breast, and then went out to the horsemen. I've given both of them their finishing stroke, but it was hard work. They tore up trees in their sore need to defend themselves, but all that is to no purpose when a man like myself comes, who can kill seven at one blow. Indeed, they have not bent one hair of mine. The horsemen would not believe him, and rode into the forest. There they found the giants swimming in their blood, and all round about lay the torn up trees. Then the company returned to the castle. I have done the deed, and desire my promised reward. Although it means I will break my promise, I still must be rid of this warrior. Before thou receivest my daughter, and half my kingdom, thou must perform one more heroic deed. In the forest roams a unicorn which does great harm, and thou must catch it. I fear one unicorn, still less than two giants. Seven at one blow is my kind of affair. Give me a rope and an axe, and it shall be done. He went forth into the forest, and again bade those who were sent with him to wait outside. He had not long to seek. The unicorn soon came towards him, and rushed directly on the tailor, as if it would spit him on its horn without further ceremony. He waited until the animal was quite close, and then sprang nimbly behind a tree. The unicorn ran against the tree with all its strength, and stuck its horn fast in the trunk. It had not strength enough to draw its horn out again, and thus it was caught. 
He came out from behind the tree and put the rope around its neck, and then, with his axe, he hewed the horn out of the tree. And when all was ready, he led the beast away and took it to the queen. I still will not give you the promised reward and make a third demand. Before the wedding, you must catch a wild boar that makes great havoc in the forest. The royal huntsmen should give you their help. Willingly, this is child's play. For a third time, he did not take his escort with him into the forest, but left them on its edge. They were pleased to stay. The wild boar had several times received them in such a manner that they had no inclination to lie in wait for him. When the boar perceived the tailor, it ran on him with foaming mouth and wetted tusks and was about to throw him to the ground. But the active hero sprang into a chapel which was near. In one swift motion, he leapt up and out a high window. The boar ran in after him, but the tailor, who was already outside, shut the door behind it. Then the raging beast was caught. The little tailor called the huntsmen thither that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes. The hero and the huntsman returned to the queen. Whether you like it or not, you are obliged to keep your promise and give me the hand of your daughter and half of your kingdom. Had she known that it was no warlike hero, but a little tailor who was standing before her, it would have gone to her heart still more than it did. The wedding was held with great magnificence and small joy, and out of a tailor a king was made. After some time, the young queen heard her husband say in his dreams at night, Boy, make me a doublet and patch the pantaloons, or else I will wrap the yard measure over thine ears. Then she discovered in what state of life the young lord had been born, and the next morning complained of her wrongs to her mother, and begged her to help her get rid of her husband, who was nothing else but a tailor. Leave thy bedroom door open this night, and my servants shall stand outside. When he has fallen asleep, they will go in, bind him, and take him on board a ship which shall carry him into the wide world. The queen's armor-bearer heard all of this and informed the tailor of the whole plot. I'll put a screw into that business. At night, he went to bed with his wife at the usual time, and when she thought that he had fallen asleep, she got up, opened the door, and then lay down again. The little tailor, who was only pretending to be asleep, cried out, Boy, make me the doublet and patch me the pantaloons, or I will wrap the yard measure over thine ears. I smote seven at one blow. I killed two giants. I brought away one unicorn and caught a wild boar. Why should I fear anyone standing outside of my room? When these men heard the tailor speaking thus, they were overcome by a great dread and ran as if the wild huntsmen were behind them and none of them would venture anything further against him. That's how a little tailor became a king and remained one until the end of his life. I hope you enjoyed the tale. When you return, perhaps I will tell you another. The Tale of the Valiant Tailor was reinterpreted by Scooter. For more information on Anansi Storytime, visit us at AnansiStoryTime.com. Follow us on Twitter at Anansi Storytime and like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Anansi Storytime. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>